Good morning. Good morning. Well, good morning, Octavia. Good morning, Riley. Good morning, Alexis. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Hey, Michonne. Good morning, Doris. Good morning, Michael. What's up, Facebook? What's up, people of God? We came to pray the Come on, put your hands together this morning. This is your prayer. It's a good Monday morning. Good morning, Sarah. I'm praying as you go back to school this morning. Come on, put your hands together. This is your declaration for this morning. If that's your testimony, would you declare? Good morning. Good morning, Diana. Good morning. Good morning, Krista. Good morning, Linda. Hey, Michelle. Good morning, Faith. What's up, Facebook? Hey, Instagram. Good morning, YouTube. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Come on, you put your hands together this Monday morning. Well, peace and blessings to you, brothers and sisters. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's Wake Up With The Word. It is Monday morning, August the 30th. I am so happy to be back this morning, thanking God for our ministerial staff that took hold of Wake Up With The Word last week, did a fantastic job. I am so proud and, and so humbled to be a, around so many wonderful, spirit-led, anointed men and women of God um, that will share the word. I thank God for the word that was dispersed to us last week. I'm so grateful to, for, to God, brothers and sisters. Thank God for all of you joining me once again. Thank God for Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Uh, the conference call, uh, all of you who are assembled together this morning, we are going to uh, enter into a new topic this morning. But before we do that, I want to, I know that there are school districts that are about to go uh, back to school. I know that there are brothers and sisters who are in the New Orleans, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana area that are enduring a storm this uh, yesterday uh, throughout the day. Uh, I know that there are brothers and sisters in Haiti that are dealing with the consequences of the earthquake and the floods that hit there about a week or so ago. And so, brothers and sisters, there is so much for us to pray for. Um, and so while your house is dry and your house is not um, being pushed around or being wind swept around, it's an opportunity for you to pray for those who are going through tough times right now. And also, as the anxiety uh, swells, as anxiousness swells in our community, as our children go back to school, and perhaps more and more of us are heading back to work, let's begin to pray for the peace of God 
and for God's intervention into our lives. So would you do me a favor while you're just get, uh, getting yourself prepared and, and taking the sleep out of your eyes? Would you just bow your heads with me and invite God's presence to be in the midst of us? Father, thank you, Lord, once again for the opportunity that we have to call upon your name. You said that you would be our Jehovah Rapha. You would be our Jehovah, the God that heals us. God, you said you would take care of us. So God, that you would be our Jehovah uh, Jireh, the God that provides for us. And God, you said that we could call upon your name and you would be a help in every time of our need. So God, we're praying right now. We're coming on one accord to recognize, oh God, that there, there, there is nothing too hard for you. And that if we want help, if we need uh, help, God, it is you that we should call upon. So God bless now those uh, young people who are heading back to school, teachers, administrators, those who are walking back into building for the first time uh, with all of the cloud of uncertainty around. We know one thing is for sure, that you are still God. You still sit on the throne. Uh, God, you still still super reign and all, all things are under your control. So God, we invite your, your presence to be in the midst of us, leading and guiding us, walking with us, walking with our children, helping them to see you and everything that, that's going on around them and helping them call upon you when they're going through uh, tough times. God bless those uh, our brothers and sisters who are in uh, Louisiana, God, and are suffering through the storm, God. We pray, oh God, that your hand would be there, oh God, that you would lead, be the leader and God, for all of us to interact and to intercede on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Brother, Father, we thank you, God, for our ability, God, to be your hands and your feet. God, for the brothers and sisters who are in Haiti going through their difficult time. God, bless us now, those of us who are living in safety. Help us, God, to think about others, oh God, as we walk through our daily lives today, oh God. Bless us and keep us in our time today. In Jesus' name, we pray and we thank you. Amen. Well, blessings to you, brothers and sisters. Do me a favor. I have been last week uh, just being being in prayer, and uh, this this thought in my mind came up. Before we do that, let's let's do that. I have uh, on last Saturday, last Saturday, uh, my wife and I we uh, went to game night for our marriage ministry at our church. And it was such a good time. And we played this game, this game called And Let the Church Say Game. Let me show you the packaging. Let the Church Say Game. It was a very thought-provoking, uh, it came in a very nice packaging. Um, it's one of the young ladies that I'm, I'm becoming familiar with. And she, she developed this game for a thought provoking game for believers, Christians to think about some things and to have healthy dialogue among yourselves. And uh, it was, it was, it was so much fun. It started so many uh, great conversations amongst the, the married couples that I thought I would uh, do some sampling uh, in our time of, of breaking the ice for the next few days, just to talk about a few of the questions and, and the, the theme, uh, the way that this works is, is I'm going to read out a statement. Your, your responsibility is to confirm it by saying amen or to, to reject it by saying I rebuke that, right? So, so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to, I'm going to read the, the statement. And then what I want you to do, I want you to either say, I want you to either say, that you reject it by saying, I rebuke that, or I want you to receive it or confirm it by saying, amen. All right, here we go. If there were some really, really tough questions that I don't even know if, if, our, commu if our community would have the time necessary to, to discuss it, but I'm gonna try one this morning. All right, here's the question. Is it okay for married couples not to wear their wedding rings when their spouses are not around. Your job is to say either amen or I rebuke that. Is it okay? Is it okay for married couples not to wear their wedding rings when their spouses are not around? Oh my God. 
I rebuke that. <laughs> okay, come on, talk to me. Talk to me. So, so, so I'm putting up the website right now. If you're interested in getting this game, it would be it's it would be so much fun as for you as thought provoking questions. There's some there's some real good question good statements in here that you can discuss. We we started to go through. I don't even know if we got through uh, four or five of them on Saturday, but it brought up so many so many other statements. So many great. Uh, points of dialogue in our discussion. Uh, everybody, oh, Sanithia said, amen, amen. Is it, <laughs> Sanithia said, amen. Uh, everybody else says, I rebuke that, I rebuke. But but trust in God, amen, <laughs> amen. All right, brothers and sisters, um, re, rebuke, but if they have a good reason, like work safety. Oh, okay, 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 angel. All right, angel. Maybe one day we can talk about what the wedding ring is all about. Why why we wear wedding wedding rings? We can talk about that because you guys know how how I am about marriage. So maybe we'll talk about that. I heard people. I heard it one time on a Facebook post that uh, I think somebody brought up about wedding rings, and there was a whole lot of. Um, different answers. And I think, I guess probably we should talk about it one day. All right. What I want to talk to you about this week, at least, at, at least the beginning of the week is, is to talk about how and why we should invoke something that I believe in the modern day kingdom of God, modern day uh, church, we do not talk about enough or we do not um, spend enough time Personally, I'm not talking about what we preach to other people. I'm talking about what we, how we look at our own lives and what we make sure is in our agenda. I'm, I'm thanking God that I have a, a great deal of business people on the line right now. And, and, and all of you, if you're getting up this, this, type, this time in the morning, Chantel, what I do know is that you have a busy day ahead of you. You have a lot of things you have to, you have to do. You have a lot of places you have to go. There's probably on your on your board uh, a great deal of to a great a lot of to do lists uh, items things that you want to get accomplished today. And in my prayer time last week, God was saying to me that the body of Christ are we are not operating in what what God considers to be His harvest. You lost your wedding ring at work. You need to get another one, Linda. Um, I I have I wear this silicone one um, during during you know when I'm messing with the car and on a regular basis. I have a I have a nicer one that I can wear, but I I wear I wear something all the time. Um, I want you to type into the chat Instagram. Facebook, God's harvest. Type that into Bernadette. Type that into. Type that into the chat. God's harvest. Type that into the chat. Type that in the chat, Janae. God's harvest. And God's harvest is harvest is is like this. You to understand it from the standpoint of a farmer. A farmer places one kernel of corn in the ground. And then he comes back a few weeks, months later, and what he discovers is that there's over, in some cases, seven, eight, nine, ten ears that is full of the kernels of corn. He plants one into the ground, but he receives a harvest that is in the multiplication. And what God said to me, Paula, is that you and I are simply receiving pay for our labor. 
that has nothing to do with God's harvest. That you and I are working hard every day. We're, we're, we're waking up early and staying up late. But we are not, we're not receiving God's harvest. What you are doing is getting wages, pay. What you are doing is getting uh, re reciprocity. You're getting back the amount that you put in. You put in an hour's worth of work and you're getting an hour's worth of pay. You're, 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 you're sending out promotions and advertisements and, and you're getting clients, but you're not getting clients on the God's harvest side. And so, and so when, when God then requires of you to give more or to share more, you feel, you feel like you can't. Because you typically only have enough for yourselves. Because of the work and the energy that has to be um, extended to just get the little bit of stuff that you have. And I'm not really talking about just money, but peace, joy. That, that you and I as, as believers are not being great examples or great commercials to the unbelieving person who is looking for answers about life. They're looking to us and we are, we are scrounging and um, as a result of us receiving the wages for our pay, it is hard for us to be great givers because we are so tired. And so, and so I begin to ask God after he convicted me, he says, he says the body of Christ, including you, son, are not enjoying the harvest that is available to you because you are operating your life after the principles of the world. So, so we are doing the same thing that we're seeing uh, being taught in school and, and being taught in, in, in books. And, and, um, and so we're, we're writing resumes and we're doing the networking game and we're, we're doing the whole thing just like the playbook of the world. And we're getting the same results, even though we have the Holy Spirit resting inside of us. All right. Is it is is that does that strike somebody? Is, 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 is it is it when you think about it, do you feel fulfilled in life? I'm talking to children of God right now. Do you do you feel like in every area of your life, if, let's say there are seven areas of a person's life, finances, spirituality, um, there's there's a there's a wheel that I'll, I'll that I'll present. There's seven areas of your life that you should be feeling fulfilled in as God's child, which makes you, uh, Chanel, what makes you simply this a great representation to the world about who, what, what, what kind of God you serve. And so brothers and sisters, I, as a shepherd of God's people, want you to live in God's harvest. Now, now God's harvest does not, does not mean that you don't have to extend energy. You see, the farmer still has to plow. He still has to weed and he still has to plant. Right? So there's, it's not sitting back doing nothing, but it is operating in the principles that God has laid out in his word versus 
us doing everything that we see operating outside of God's kingdom and making that the model by which we live. Talk back to me, Paula. Yes, I'll tell you the seven things. Um, I'll tell you tomorrow. I'll tell you the, what those seven things are. Okay, so so I want to give you, I want to give you what God has given me, and it will. I believe what it will do is it will it will go against the grain of our carnal hearts. Woo! Turn with me, brothers and sisters, to James. Uh, chapter number three, I'm going to read verses 13 through 18. And it blew my mind. Here's what James says. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility. That's a word we don't hear much anymore. That comes from wisdom. Verse 14, check this out. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, Lord have mercy. This is going to mess us up. All of us are ambitious. But, but he says, if you harbor, he puts bitter envy and selfish ambition in the same place. Everybody knows that we should not harbor bitter envy, but he also says, if you have selfish ambition in your hearts, do not, he says, do not boast about it or deny this simple truth. Stay with me. James is saying that, that there, if there are, is there any wise people among us? Are there any people of, of us who knows the secret of success? That's what wise people do. Wise people know the secret of success. He says, let them show the, their wisdom by their lifestyle. Ah! Such wisdom, he says, the wisdom of the, of, of, of the unwise is harboring self, uh, harboring bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts. He says, when you harbor either of these two, you, you, he says, instead of us who, I, I can't, I can't even, I can't even tell y'all brothers and sisters, how many believers uh, tout their ambition. He says, if you have selfish ambition or envious envy in your heart, don't boast about it. Because because by, by carrying those two things, you deny this truth. You deny the truth that, that you're wise. Because what here's what he says, verse 15, such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, Paula, watch this now, and demonic. That if I'm waking up every morning and 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 I'm trying to grind, make the grind and make my two pennies and build myself up and build my business and build my my portfolio and build myself up and get myself on a in a status, God's word says, number one, it's not wise. <laughs> number two, it's not spiritual. Number three, it is demonic. Lord have mercy. For where you have envy and self ambition, oh, if y'all will take, if y'all, if you would take this, you know this is true. Where I have envy and self ambition, what follows this is disorder and evil practices. That, that when self-ambition or envy is the rule of my day, what I discover is it will lead me to a place where I ultimately will compromise God's word. I will find disorder in my life where I want God's peace. 
I will find disorder in my marriage, disorder in my family, disorder in my finances, disorder in my mind, disorder in my relationships. And, and before I start blaming other people as to why I don't have any good friends and, and why everybody seems to be against me and why nobody seems to be on my side and, and why nobody ever checks on me before you go down that route. Before it's always your husband or before it's always your wife, there needs to be a check to see if, in fact, there is a seed that I planted called envy or self-ambition that has that has sprouted out. Talk to me, somebody. Disorder and evil practices in my house. When I've made up my mind that it's all about me building this up and making sure that this is on another, on another level, what I do then is I plant the seed of, oh, God have mercy. Um, this, this, this is not from heaven. It is unspiritual. And God wants me to let you know this morning that it is demonic. And you're opening up the doors for the enemy to come in and 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 play havoc in your life. And then you're going to look for someone to blame. But it started with your self-ambition and your envy. All right. Here's where I want to get to. Verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven first is pure. How many have on your to-do list this morning, Lord, keep my mind pure? No, you don't. You got all this other stuff. Make these calls, correct the, get these deals, beat my competitors. Find the edge. How can I get over? How do I turn? How do I turn social media off? Because I'm tired of seeing other people get what I want. Envy and self-ambition is unspiritual and demonic. But God says the wisdom of God first is pure. I want you to put on your, your to-do list this morning these things. He says, first, it starts with a pure heart. Then it starts with peace-loving consideration. Next, it is submissive. Lord, have mercy. That, that, is, that is not on any of our lists. Full of mercy and good fruit, being impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Lord have mercy, brothers and sisters. None of those things are on today's believers, child of God's list to do. And therefore, we have not the wisdom of God. And so on this one day, I want you to talk about, I want you to place, and I know this is not, this is not uh, subconscious, even though all of you are have the Holy Spirit. You as a believer, do you, do you wake up in the morning and make sure that on your to-do list starts with being considerate? I'm not talking to people who are not believers this morning. I'm not talking about those of you who are not uh, uh, Jesus followers. You can, you can hold us accountable because this is how we should be living. Being considerate, I believe today is one of the un undervalued, underrated uh, attitudes in the body of Christ. Now, now here's what I know. Everyone understands. Everyone knows here when they're when people are inconsiderate to you. You you got that down. 
You, you clearly understand that. Oh, they're inconsiderate to me. Someone's not looking out for me. But, but, my, but my question is this, is do you put in your agenda, your to-do list, your must-haves that you must be considerate? Rarely, brothers and sisters, do we think of being considerate as a valuable attitude in our dealings in life. Come to think of, brothers and sisters, here's what I've come to understand, even in the body of Christ. We have now um, considered us being considerate people who, who are now considered gullible. I'm not letting people take over, take, take, take advantage of me. So, so what you have done is you've given yourself an excuse to not consider other people. Not consider your coworkers, not consider your husbands, not consider your wife, not consider your child, not consider your friends, not consider your brothers and sisters. You have, you have made up in your mind that life ends and begins with you. And let me remind you, brothers and sisters, that this thought process or this operate this operation, this is this way of living that you now consider to be wise, God says is both unspiritual and it's demonic. And it, it is a reason why you are not seeing God's hand in your life. People of God, we have made up in our mind that what we will be, instead of being considerate, is that we will be civil. We have we have pushed we have pushed consideration all the way down to the place where we feel we feel it's enough for us to be civil. Right. But those two things are not the same. I'm civil with people who are civil with me. I'm, I'm kind to people who are kind to me. I am nice to people, or at least I'm not nasty to people who are not nasty to me. That's civil. What considerate people do is they look for opportunities to think and to share their hearts into other people's lives and to, and to put, put other people ahead of them. Lord have mercy. Yes, yes, Paulers. It is, it is to be considerate is to be other minded. And not and and so and so I, I'm confessing this morning, brothers and sisters. I'm laying it before the altar for you because I went through a whole weekend of repenting for this. But but here's the question for you: is is on your on your board, on your to-do list? Do you have as your to-do list? Let me try to be other-minded today because let me remind you, when you are others other-minded, God calls you wise. And what he says is that you ultimately sow in peace and reap the harvest of righteousness. We have bought into, brothers and sisters, I'm talking about the body of Christ. We have bought into the me, me generation. We have made everything about whether or not it is convenient for me. And that's okay. As long as you don't mind receiving wages. If you are angry about not receiving God's harvest, then you look, then we all have to look back at how, what are the seeds that we are sowing? Lord, come on, somebody. And so, so I have started this process in my own heart about being considerate and thinking about it ahead of time. How, how can I be more considerate of others instead of just looking for uh, uh, a ways to increase my own 
life? How can I pour into other people's lives with no strings attached and, and plant that seed down so that I can ultimately yield a harvest that only God can give me? Okay, I, 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 I wore you out. We, we, we'll, we'll go into this to, uh, the rest of the week. Uh, but I want you to start small. Put that on, put that on the chat. Put that on the chat, Tiffany. Everybody put it on the chat. Start small. Being considerate, brothers and sisters, often involves doing something small for someone else. For example, making sure that there's a clean clean kitchen when you leave. It, 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 it says that you open the door for others instead of waiting for someone to open the door for you. Think small. Let somebody go ahead of you in line instead of you rushing to get there before when you see the other person out of the side of your eye, they're coming with all of these groceries. And so you jump in front of them. Small things, brothers and sisters, begin the process of operating in a considerate mind. Next thing I want you to do is I want you to learn how to share <laughs> Share your space. Stop, stop being so selfish minded in your own ways and doing things. Stop, car stop looking for little ways to carve out time and space only for yourself without ever thinking about anybody else. I, I find people now are looking to big, get bigger houses so they can get further and further away from each other. I'm going to get seven TVs so that none of us have to ever share watching the th same thing twice. We, 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 are, we, are, we are working harder so that we can become less considerate of others. I want my own. I don't want to share. I don't want to have to go where you want to go. I want to go where I want to go. I want to go to the store. I want to go. So, so if your car is going to this mall, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save up enough money to get my own car so I can go to my own the store I want to go to. That's the life we're living. That's the, that's the unhealthy, the unspiritual, the, the demonic way we're living. And so we're not seeing miracles and, and God's power being performed in our lives because we are making little things so important for ourselves to separate us. And I want my own taste. Uh, uh, our family went out to uh, Maggiano's yesterday. And when we went to celebrate uh, one of the little girls at church, um, a birthday, and, and there was 20 of us or so. And at Maggiano's, if, some, if, you've, if you've been there, if you have these large... Um, large parties, they have this thing that they suggest you do called family dinners, right? And family dinners where you look over the menu and you pick two starters and two pastas and two entrees and two desserts, but everyone doesn't get what they want. It, 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 was, a, it was a microcosm. And, and so everybody doesn't get what they want. You, you, you have to, you have to move yourself over to, to, to share the food. But it was so, so miraculous that we didn't spend an hour complaining about what we want, even though we're paying for the food. We, we told the young lady who was celebrating her birthday, get what you want. We'll figure it out. And I can imagine, brothers and sisters, you don't want to go to anything like that because you don't want to have to eat or pay for food that, that is like not exactly what you want. Lord, have mercy. So you, I, 
I'm not going. I don't go to no restaurants. I got to eat food. I don't want. I want to go to get what I exactly want. You're inconsiderate. I got money. This is my money. I'm going to buy exactly what I want because I'm going to eat exactly what I want. Your ways, brothers and sisters, are unspiritual. And they are demonic. And, and demonic simply means that it opens up the door for the enemy to bring in all of the spirits that he wants to bring into your life. And so, so introduction, let's go. I'm done. Let's start small today by putting being considerate on our to-do list. Putting being considerate. Not, not waiting for someone to be considerate of us. I know, I know you got that down pat. I'm talking about, let's make sure that you make up in your mind that today you're going to operate in consideration. You're going to think of others, other people first before you think of yourself. That's it. Y'all going to stay with me this week? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for keep digging in us because it is your goal to conform us to the image of your dear son, to make us not, less like us and more like Christ. And so God, we, we jump back on the wheel with our scarred and marred selves. We hop back up on the potter's wheel in order for you to shape us, and mold us, into the vessel of honor that you can use during these days. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't throw us away, but you still say that you can use us because we're still moldable. We're still pliable. We're still soft enough to be shaped in your hands. God, break up fallow ground in our hearts. Break up hardness in our spirits. Break up the spirit that I know it all, that everything I'm doing is right, and I deserve to be envious, and I deserve to be bitter, and I deserve to, to get something myself. I deserve to have some selfishness in my life. I rebuke that spirit. In the name of Jesus, because I opened up the door, God, for your harvest to be revealed in our lives. Show us how to work less and receive more. Show us how to be wise by being pure, having our thoughts, thinking of others instead of ourselves. Help us to pray for others. Help us to want to be there for others. Help us to give to others. Help us to show ourselves to others. In Jesus' name, we pray and we thank you. And God's people say together, let it be so in my life. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Let's do it. I believe it's going to yield the harvest. Have a great day in the Lord. Bye-bye.